Hello, Alex here, and in this video, I want to share my thoughts on the Olympus Pen FT, a half frame 35mm interchangeable lens SLR camera. I had the opportunity to borrow both the camera and the 38mm f1.8 kit lens from a friend a good while ago, and while I had it, I shot three rolls of film through it. So these are just my first impressions, not a full review, but without further ado, let's get into it. The Olympus Pen FT is one of three cameras in the Pen F range, the old Pen F range, consisting of the Pen F, the Pen FT, and the Pen F V. The main difference between these is that the Pen FT has a light meter, whereas the other two do not, but there are smaller other distinguishing features. All three of these cameras shoot in the half frame format, meaning that they capture 24 by 18 millimeter, four is to three aspect ratio photographs that are half the size of a normal 35 millimeter frame. This means that the maximum potential resolution of your photograph is halved, but you get twice as many photographs on a roll of film. 72 exposures on a 36 exposure roll, 48 on a 24, etc. Aside from the greater film economy, the other main difference is that this smaller format, combined with being an SLR, enables the use of a much smaller mirror and the design of much smaller lenses to cover the smaller image circle, yielding a much more portable, compact overall package. These are interchangeable lens cameras and there are quite a number of lenses for the system, ranging from 20 to 800 millimeter focal lengths, with an approximate crop factor of about 1.4 it's not the same because 4 to 3 and 3 to 2 are not the same aspect ratio, but about 1.4x. You're talking an equivalent to about a 28mm all the way up to a 1120mm field of view in 35mm terms. You have zoom lenses, you have macro lenses, extension tubes, close-up adapters, right angle viewfinders. I mean, this is truly a set of system cameras. They're not to be considered toys by any means just because they shoot half frame. The Pen FT is a primarily metal built camera and feels extremely solid in the hand. I do think that they definitely uh, restricted or hindered some technical functional aspects of the camera just to maintain the aesthetic, which I'll talk more about later. But overall, I do think the design is very pleasing, which cannot be said for a lot of half frame cameras. These cameras are completely mechanical, apart from needing a battery in the case of the Pen FT to power the light meter. The shutter though is completely mechanical and shutter speeds range from 1 500th of a second down to one second in whole stop increments plus the obvious bulb. The shutter in these cameras is a rotary disc shutter which I believe is made of titanium and it's very different to what you expect in a normal like 35mm SLR. It's not your standard dual curtain arrangement whether they're metal or cloth vertically or horizontally traveling. It's completely different. For all practical purposes, it's more similar in its behavior to a leaf shutter, but in the body rather than an in-body focal plane shutter or even an in-lens leaf shutter. This gives you the benefits of a leaf shutter type system with the compactness of the lenses not having to include their own leaf shutters in every single lens. The shutter speed dial is located on the front of the body and lies roughly where your middle finger would lay when you're holding the camera and actually gripping it. If you lift up this dial and then rotate it, you can adjust the ISO, which will either inform the light meter or give you an approximate reminder of what film you have loaded in the camera because 72 frames takes quite a while to get through unless you're just blasting for the hell of it. And there is no memo holder on the back door of the camera. So, you know, that might play a small role in helping you remember what you're doing. The front of the camera also bears the self timer lever, which lasts somewhere in the region of 10 seconds, depending on the condition of the mechanics in your particular copy of the camera. Obviously the front also bears the actual lens mount, which is a bayonet style mount turning in the Nikon direction. Taking the lens off, you can clearly see the sideways mirror contained within. And if you rotate the camera sideways, you can look up and see that the focusing screen is oriented vertically because this being a 24 by 18 millimeter frame camera with the film being transported horizontally in the usual way that means your pictures and thus your viewfinder must be in portrait orientation by default. 
On the top of the camera, we see on the left hand side the film rewind lever, which can also be lifted up all the way to open the rear door to access your film for loading and unloading. And also the frame counter, which can be a little bit difficult to read, but that's common with a lot of half frame cameras, not strictly unique to this one. Just because it's a small circle, it's quite, quite densely packed and it can be hard to read. The last thing seen on the top plate of the camera is the aforementioned shutter release button, which is more of a corrugated edge style rather than a discrete circular button that more people would be used to. On the bottom of the camera, we have our standard tripod socket, as well as the film rewind button, which you can also use for double exposures, as I'll talk about later on. And then the battery compartment cover for the 1.35 volt mercury battery. Yikes. Honestly, I wouldn't worry about that too much because I'll get into it in a bit, but the light meter, not the best. So there are a lot of things to like about this camera. I do have some bad things to say, but overall, I really like it. So number one, obviously, is the film economy. Being able to get twice as many individual photographs, regardless of their specific quality, out of a roll of film makes it, you know, quite easy to justify, especially long term if you're shooting a lot of rolls of film. This thing would pay for itself versus like a K1000, an F2, whatever, reasonably quickly, just by getting X number of photos out of half as many rolls. Size and weight is the next big thing. The camera is pretty much all metal and the lenses are quite dense, but the lens and body together come in at about 560 grams, which is, even with the lens, a lot less than a lot of 35 millimeter SLRs of similar build quality without a lens attached to them. So it's, it's heavy, you know, it's more than a pound. It's more than half a kilo in an absolute sense. It's not a featherweight plastic camera. But for what it is, it is relatively light and it's certainly very small and easy to pack and carry around. And Jesus, I mean, the lenses, most of the like normal-ish focal length lenses are not much bigger than a roll of 35 millimeter film. So a kit would take up comparatively zero space. Flash sync. I mentioned that the rotary shutter is functionally analogous to a leaf shutter in terms of its performance. The main reason being that the rotary shutter can sync at any shutter speed when using flash, all the way up to 1 500th of a second. That's really good, and that is something definitely worth praising. I don't know why this is only used in this camera, there must be some reason it's not really workable on larger formats, maybe the physical inertia of the disc just becomes problematic for shutter timing or higher shutter speeds, I don't know, but in this camera, it's really really good for that. The camera doesn't have TTL metering, of course, being completely mechanical, but you could use a manual flash or something like a thyristor flash because even though thyristor flashes tend to have very high trigger voltages, there aren't any electronics in the shutter to hurt, so... The lenses. There are a ton of lenses to choose from, like I said, from wide angle to hyper telephoto more than a thousand millimeter equivalent. There's re you're not really stuck for options except in the ultra ultra wide and fisheye kind of realm. But there are official adapters for other lens mounts if you want to go down that kind of route. Even so, this 38mm f1.8, which is just your standard nifty 50 type kit lens, it's about a 53mm equivalent field of view. It's very sharp, it has great contrast, it has surprisingly good flare resistance. I've shot it directly into the sun on multiple occasions with no problems whatsoever. And honestly, if this lens is in any way indicative of the quality you can expect throughout the rest of the lens lineup, I think it would be hard to be disappointed. The film economy. It's a double-edged sword. Like I said at the start, you get twice as many frames, but they are half as physically big. This limits your maximum potential resolution to half what it would be if you shot with the same lens, which you could do with an adapter, just in principle, using the same film in a full frame 35 millimeter camera. For some people, that's gonna be a problem, for others not. Realistically, shoot at a moderate aperture with a decent film, you know, don't shoot old expired C200 or something through it, that would be ridiculous. And then you will get nice pictures that you can probably print 16 by 20 at, you know, 150 DPI, something like that, without any crazy problems. It's not that bad, but it is technically not as good as a full frame 35 millimeter camera 
in that regard. The light meter. I mentioned that I don't like this thing and the way it works is when you set your shutter speed on the front of the camera, a needle will flow somewhere between the numbers 0 to 7 in the viewfinder. That tells you 0 meaning wide open and any number beyond that, how many stops down from wide open you need to stop down the lens for an accurate exposure based on whatever you're metering. So if you see a 4 in the viewfinder, that doesn't mean f4, that doesn't mean an EV value of 4. Exposure value value, whatever. That means you need to be four stops down from wide open. Now this doesn't benefit like serious photographers, I hate saying that, but you know what I mean, who understand, you know, exposure settings, aperture, shutter speed, ISO relatively well. If you want to meter, look through there, it tells you f5.6, you look at the lens, you turn to f5.6, click, perfect. You don't get that with this camera. If it says four, you need to go wide open and then four stops down. But on some of the lenses, you can physically just turn the aperture ring 180 degrees around, which feels so, so wrong. And then you go from an f-stop scale to a zero to seven scale. I don't like it. I understand why it's there. It makes things much more accessible to a lot of people but it just adds a level of mental translation that you have to do when you're trying to convert what's in the meter to what's on the lens to the settings that you actually want to use. It just adds a small layer of complexity that can interrupt your flow. And for a camera like this, spur of the moment things are kind of perfect a lot of the time. You know, spontaneous things. You bring the camera with you on a drive to a party, whatever this could get in the way of that and it's just not a good design in my opinion whatsoever. The OEV system as I call it, don't like it. Just give me a normal meter or a blank match needle meter. The shutter release button being right on the edge of the top plate of the camera makes it extremely easy to trigger just by picking up the camera or putting it in or taking it out of your bag. There is no shutter lock and there's no way to prevent yourself from accidentally firing off an exposure other than just being extremely careful. This wouldn't be as much of a problem if it weren't for the fact that there's no easy way to do multiple exposures with this camera. Like a lot of cameras, you can press the film rewind button to decouple the film advance uh, and then just advance the advance lever to recock the shutter without advancing the film. It's a good workaround and it does work for doubling multiple exposures reasonably well but you shouldn't have to do it to not accidentally waste a frame just by picking the camera up. I'm not a fan of the position of the shutter speed dial. I feel like if it were on the top of the camera, you would take the camera down from your eye and you could see the shutter speed relatively easily. No, you have to turn the camera and look down and that's just annoying. This is one of those things that I think aesthetics took place over functionality because it is a perfectly normal arrangement of a shutter speed dial with a lift to turn to do the ASA, fine. I do think it would have been better, if admittedly extremely more ugly, if they just had a stepped top plate with a normal shutter speed dial, like certain rangefinder cameras do. Like the, I think the Zeiss Icon does that. It's a fairly common thing. With the right camera, it can work well. I understand why with such a small camera that they didn't, but I don't have to like it. The use of mercury batteries for the light meter is a big no-no. You have to either get a voltage converter or regulator to use a normal 1.5 volt battery that you can get now, or some people have even got their cameras modified to recalibrate with 1.5 volt batteries. Personally, I wouldn't bother if I actually bought one of these cameras. I would just get the regular Pen F, not have the light meter whatsoever, and just use like my phone or something or a handheld light meter. You can figure out all kinds of things. I don't think it's really worth going through the rigmarole of like voltage conversions and stuff for this particular light meter. The viewfinder is actually quite a lot dimmer on the Pen FT than on the Pen F or FV. Now I haven't tried those to compare, obviously, but the fact that there are so many reports online about this means it's probably true. And it sounds like it's a pretty severe difference. So if you don't want the internal light meter, or just don't like the Pen FT's specific OEV system of a light meter, then it's definitely worth considering getting one of the other cameras just to not have to deal with that loss in light transmission. Scanning. 
This applies to all half frame cameras, but it's not something that I see discussed a lot and I'm not going to be doing a lot of half frame content on this channel, so I want to bring it up while I have the chance. This sounds stupid, but there are two ways you can scan half frame pictures. As individual half frames, or as a 35mm frame containing two images, right? A lot of labs will either only do single frame scanning and charge you more for the extra work, which is, you know, fair to a point, but it negates some of the cost savings of shooting half frame in the first place, or they will do the two in one, the kind of organic diptychs. You can crop them out and separate them later, but they'll give you one frame with two photographs in it. The problem arises with this diptych kind of scanning method when your photos are shot under either very different lighting conditions, say one is indoors under fluorescent lighting, the other is outdoors under bright sunny light or overcast cloudy weather. Or if there's a large difference in exposure and thus density in the frames. This will cause any kind of inversion software, grain to pixel, negative lab pro, whatever's in an Aritsu, whatever, to freak out a little bit. It'll screw up your black point and your white point as well as your color calibration. So if your photos are significantly different in either color balance or color palette or the actual exposure and density, it's very likely you'll end up with one of them coming out well and the other coming out like absolute crap. I've seen this a lot with the scans where I tried this and in Negative Lab Pro, I ended up just having to like crop across to one frame, process that, recrop across and reinvert the other one. If I tried to do both together, it just went to absolute crap and there was no way I was going to be able to do that. So if your lab does do the dual scanning diptych method, they might actually end up giving you scans that don't necessarily reflect how good the images are in the actual film. Again, this applies to all half frame cameras, but it is definitely something worth looking into. I mean, you might be fine. It depends on what kind of conditions you shoot under. That's entirely what it depends on. But it's worth bearing in mind that it could potentially lead to you getting a, you know, a wee transfer full of pretty crappy scans of negatives that are actually really good. I'd like to give a huge thanks to Mark for letting me borrow his camera for a few weeks. I did let him borrow the X-Pan for half a day. I think that kind of checks out a little bit. Uh, I didn't just take his camera for a while. Nevertheless, it was an absolute blast to use and as much as I do like it, and I really love the lenses and having a 20 on half frame, that sounds like perfect for me for everyday wide angle street kind of stuff. There are so many small things that I just really, they're not even wrong or bad. They just kind of rub me the wrong way that I couldn't bring myself to buy one of these cameras. If you have any experience with this or any other half frame camera, let me know in the comments down below. And I wanna see if other people's kind of opinions align with mine. Am I alone in what I do and don't like about this camera? Are some of these thoughts more common or outrageous and radical compared to the community at large? Yeah, let me know. So that will be it for this video. Stay safe and bye bye for now. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at Shaka1277 for new pictures every day. If you like this video and enjoy what I do on the channel, please consider subscribing or checking out my Patreon where the tiers start at just one euro per month.